I'm uh, very happy at this time to introduce our keynote speaker uh, for this afternoon, Dr. George Rebeck of Indiana University of Bloomington. Uh, Dr. Rebeck graduated from Villanova uh, with his BA degree in psychology in 1971. He then earned his MA and his PhD from the University of Colorado at Boulder uh, in biopsychology. Uh, and following a postdoc uh, at the University of California, San Diego, he took the position at Indiana University. Uh, he's been there ever since, and is cur he currently holds the position of Chancellor's Professor, which is a distinguished professorship uh, uh, in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences. He also serves as Director of their Neuroscience Program. Uh, Dr. Rebeck is a Fellow of the Association for Psychological Science, and of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, he serves on the editorial boards of Behavioral Brain Research and the International Journal of Neuropsychopharmacology. He also served as president of the Association of Neuroscience Departments and Programs. Uh, Dr. Rebeck has been an extraordinarily productive researcher. Uh, his work has been supported extensively uh, by a variety of federal agencies and private <coughs> foundations. Um, uh, and he has published over 200 journal articles and uh, invited book chapters. Uh, Dr. Rebeck's work focus mo focuses most generally on the neurochemical correlates of behavior. Uh, he's been especially interested in the neurochemistry of the basal ganglia uh, and related limbic nuclei. Uh, one branch of this research uh, focuses on the neural network dysfunction underlying Huntington's disease, uh, which is a fatal neurogenerative uh, disease. The title of Dr. Rubik's talk today is From Oranges, uh, to, From Oranges to Brains, What We've Learned About Vitamin C is Leading to New Therapeutic Targets for Huntington's Disease. Please join me in welcoming Dr. George Rubik. Thank you very much. I'm very uh, delighted to be here, and uh, I'm very honored to be here as well. It's great to come back to campus and to, to see everyone. And this is where it all started, you know. This is where I began my interest in, in neuroscience and neurochemical correlates of behavior. It was back in the old uh, physio psych class that uh, Ingeborg Ward taught and then a follow-up class with Byron Ward. And so I'm happy to come back to where it all started. And um, from here, the rest has been history. And like history, I'm going to tell you a little story today. And it's a story that uh, involves uh, Huntington's disease. So I'll give you a little bit of background regarding Huntington's disease. And I'll talk a little bit about vitamin C, too. Now, <clears throat> when I started my research, I didn't start working on Huntington's disease. I didn't start working on vitamin C. You just start working on basic research. You start following a lead, and you follow your nose, and your nose leads you somewhere. And today, I have a story to tell you about Huntington's disease because that's where we're going with our research right now. And Huntington's disease, as Tom mentioned, it's a progressive neuropathological condition. The incidence of Huntington's disease is about 1 in 10,000. And one of the reasons for having some interest in Huntington's disease is that there are some commonalities between Huntington's and other kinds of neurodegenerative conditions like Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease or ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's syndrome. Huntington's disease, unlike those other conditions, though, is caused by a single gene mutation. It's a dominant gene mutation. It occurs in a gene called Huntington. Uh, the disease was originally characterized by George Huntington about 150 years ago in Long Island, where he noticed a, a group of patients that had these types of symptoms, symptoms that generally appear in midlife. They're motor abnormalities, and, and usually it's the motor abnormalities that bring patients into the clinic to see the neurologist. Originally, the disease was called Huntington's chorea, or Huntington's dance, because the motor abnormalities involve uncontrollable movements. There's a lot of twitching, writhing, uh, and it becomes progressively worse over the course of the disease. There's also cognitive deficits. Uh, dementia develops with Huntington's disease. There's emotional disturbances, psychosis. So after about 15 or 20 years from diagnosis, death is the end result. There's no effective treatment. The gene was identified back in 1993 
so we know a little bit about the gene. The mutation is caused by an expanded CAG repeat. CAG, the codon CAG, codes for glutamine. It's an amino acid. And we all have a CAG repeat in our Huntington gene. Most people have about 20 of those repeats. So there's 20 glutamines in a row in the Huntington protein. If you have more than about 37 or 38 of those repeats, your chances of Huntington's disease are pretty high. And if you have more than 39 of those repeats, you're going to get Huntington's disease, no matter what you do. And the more of those repeats you have, the sooner you get the disease. There are some people who have upwards of 80 or 90 repeats. And so they get Huntington's disease or start showing these symptoms when they're teenagers or even earlier. They have what's called juvenile Huntington's disease. Most people get the disease in midlife, in their 40s or 50s. The main problem is a loss of neurons. There's neurodegeneration, and it occurs in the basal ganglia, especially the striatum and the cerebral cortex. And that's pretty evident here in this slide. This is a couple of frontal sections or coronal sections, control brain, a Huntington's brain, and Right near the lateral ventricles is the striatum on either side, and of course the overlying cortex. You can see the problem in Huntington's disease. These expanded lateral ventricles are due to the fact that the striatum is virtually gone. About 95% of the neurons in the striatum disappear over time with Huntington's disease. The cortex, the overlying cortex, is dramatically shrunken. There's a loss of about 80% of cortical neurons. And that's important because cortex talks to striatum. There's an important communication link between cortex and striatum. So we have a massive loss of cells, especially in those two areas of the brain. So if you're an HD researcher, you ask yourself, why are these cells dying? You know, why are you losing cortical neurons? Why are you losing striatal neurons? Now, some HD researchers that like to read detective novels ask the question, why are these cells dying? Is it murder or is it suicide? Is there something out there killing these cells? Is there some toxic mechanism that's killing these cells? Or are the cells just dying of their own accord? Are they committing suicide through a process called apoptosis? Well, we've been working on Huntington's disease, I guess, for the last 10 or 11 years now. And I'm here to tell you that it's not murder, it's not suicide. The best analogy for what's happening in Huntington's disease, I think, is the problem is more like what happens after about 25 years of marriage. It's a communication problem. The problem in Huntington's disease is a communication problem. What do neurons do? They communicate. That's their job. That's the job of the nervous system. Neurons send impulses. They travel down axons. They synapse with dendrites. Information gets passed on to other cells in the circuit. Huntington's disease is a neural circuit problem. And when these neurons are not functioning properly, symptoms develop. Those holes you saw in the brain they come at autopsy. Patients have had the disease for at least 15 years already. It's not the loss of cells that's the problem. There's no reason to rescue cells if they're not functioning properly. So we've been interested in trying to figure out what's making these cells dysfunctional. So the problem here is a communication problem. The cortex and the basal ganglia are closely linked. And when they're not functioning properly, you have behavioral problems. Behavioral problems that are expressed with motor deficits, with cognitive deficits, with emotional deficits. So how do you study communication in Huntington's disease? Well, it's difficult to study it in people, especially at the cellular level. So we use models, animal models. We're interested in using mouse models. There's actually a lot of mouse models available now for Huntington's disease. There's also um, 
fruit fly models. There's worm models of Huntington's disease. There's cell culture models of Huntington's disease. It depends on the question you're interested in. We're interested in how the neural circuits are altered in Huntington's disease, so we're studying this in mice which have striatum, which have a cortex, and we can look to see how these cells are talking to one another. And there's two models that we, we use. There's the R62 model, sometimes called a truncated model, because the R62 model has the portion of the gene that has the mutation. It's an exon 1 of that gene. It's a big gene. It has 67 exons. But exon 1 has the mutation. That's what has those repeats. And that exon is inserted into the genome of these mice, and they develop symptoms very early. They really have juvenile Huntington's. They start getting symptoms at six weeks of age. And these mice are dead by 13 or 14 weeks. They don't live very long. But it's a pop because the symptoms are very robust. They're easy to characterize. You can go through the whole process of Huntington's disease in a few short weeks. There's also a knock-in model that we use. It's, a, it's called a knock-in model because you take that exon that has the mutation and actually insert it into the Huntington gene itself. These animals show milder symptoms and they develop a little bit later. It's more of a model of adult onset Huntington's disease. These mice start showing symptoms after 30 weeks of age and they live almost uh, a year and a half or so, almost the full lifespan of a mouse. So those are the two models that we've been using over the course of a few years. And if we're going to study communication, we use electrodes to do that. We implant these electrodes in the brain. This white part is what's actually attached to the animal's head. And we attach that during stereotaxic surgery. And there's two bundles of wires. They're implanted bilaterally. One bundle is in the striatum on one side and the striatum on the other side, or in the cortex of one side or in the cortex of the other side. There are four electrodes in each bundle and there's a reference electrode in each bundle. And after the surgery is over, we wait about a week, allow the animals to recover, and then we plug them in. And this is what they look like when they're plugged in. This is an R62 mouse. All of our recordings that I'm going to talk about today are from awake behaving animals. We want to know how these circuits operate when animals are behaving. So the best way to do that is to record when the animals are moving around. And these animals are in an open field. They can pretty much do whatever they want. And we see what kind of neural signals we get. And this is what the computer screen looks like. It looks kind of fancy, but basically we're just recording extracellular action potentials. Here we have eight of them from those eight wires. Each one of these wires is picking up a, a neural signal. In some cases there are two signals per wire, and we can distinguish one signal from another because cells are not always exactly the same distance from the electrode, so the action potential is going to be a little taller, or going to be a little wider, and we can make a distinction. So some wires can actually pick up two or th even three different cells, and they get displayed on our, com on our computer screen, and it just rotates through real time. So each one of these little tick marks represents one of these spikes. So we can monitor neural activity over time. And what we would do is record the activity of single neurons, individual cells. We record the firing rate of those cells, how fast they fire. We record the pattern of activity that these cells have, especially bursting. Bursting is just a cluster of spikes that occur in time. And it conveys information. You know, when neurons fire, that's information. It's part of communication. But it's not just the rate that's critical. It's also the pattern, because the pattern conveys information, too. It's just like an SOS signal. You know, you got your dots and you got your dashes. Bursting is sort of like that. You might get a cluster of spikes and then a pause and then another cluster of spikes. That's conveying information, more information than just a series of individual spikes. We also look at how closely neurons are correlated with each other. So if one neuron's firing, what's its neighbor doing? Is it firing, too, or is it silent? Are they Synchronous, are they firing together? And then we look at populations. We record local field potentials. It's sort of like an EEG signal. So we can pick up larger populations of activity in deep layers of cortex or, or within the striatum. So that's the kind of data we collect. And this is sort of all you need to know about the data
that we've collected so far. There's a lot of information here, but it's, it's not that complicated. Let me just go through it briefly. This is a sample of 60 seconds worth of data. We record from our animals for about 30 minutes or so in that open field arena. So this is one minute worth of data. And here at the top is a wild type animal, that's a control. And we have five neurons we're recording from, from this animal. And each one of these tick marks represents a spike or action potential. And some of these tick marks are shaded. And the shading means that's a burst. It's a cluster of spikes. So if you look at neuron one, unit one up there, there's a bunch of bursts occurring. There's some individual spikes and more bursts. So similar things for unit two, some individual spikes and then clusters of bursts. And if you sum up this activity, which is what is represented here, you're summing up the activity of neurons as they fire together. And you see these peaks. You know, it's sort of like a, a city skyline. You know, there's a skyscraper here. You know, this neuron is bursting. A lot of these neurons are bursting together. It's coincident bursting. One neuron's bursting. Many of the others around it are bursting. And that's very characteristic of wild-type neurons. This is in the striatum. This is the R62 animal. This is a symptomatic animal recording about eight weeks of age. Five neurons again. But in this case, there's some bursting, at least in unit one. Unit two is hardly bursting at all. In fact, unit three is hardly even firing. Not much going on with unit four, very little bursting. Unit five is going crazy. There's firing all over the place here. And if you sum up the firing rate, you certainly don't have a city skyline. This is an Indiana cornfield. It's flat. <laughs> There's no correlated activity. The same thing is happening in the knock-in model. This is the wild type or control for the knock-in model. Again, you can see these peaks. When neurons burst, they tend to burst together. They're not doing that in the knock-in animal. Again, this is a symptomatic HD mouse. Two sure. Striatum, striatum. Sorry. And actually, the data are very similar in cortex, too. Now, are the scales the same for the wild type and R62 animals? Yes. Scales are the same. We've, we've made these recordings in over 600 neurons. So I'm only showing you a few, but it's pretty much very consistent across neurons within a model and between models. So there's a change in the firing pattern, change in the number of spike bursts, change in coincident bursting. And the change is there's less bursting. There's a decrease in bursting. <coughs> R62 animals, knock-in animals burst less in striatum and in cortex. There's a decrease in coincident bursting. So they're not firing together. They're not firing in any synchronous pattern. Now we've looked at this firing in relation to behavior. And we've done this with an actometer. This is some work we've done, we've done together with uh, Steve Fowler at the University of Kansas. The actometer is kind of an interesting device. It's an open field. It's about 20 square inches surface area. And it has force plate sensors or force detectors at each corner. And even though a mouse only weighs about 25 grams, this thing is very sensitive. So when the animal steps, the actometer can pick it up. We can measure how fast the animals move. We can measure how far they move. We can measure when they pick their floor paws up and put them on the wall because there's less weight on the floor. We can pick up how they walk, gait parameters. The same thing happens in people. People with Huntington's disease have a hard time walking. They're shaking. They're wobbling all over the place. And we can time lock these behaviors to our neural data. This is a little film clip I'll show you. This is the surface of the actometer. We divide it up here into four outside quadrants, and then we have a center quadrant. And what you'll see is just the movement of the animal along this surface of the actometer. It'll just give you an idea of how, what kind of data we actually record. So this is a wild-type animal. 
and it moves around. It, it, it spends most of its time along the walls. It very rarely goes into the center. But while the animal's moving, we can find out how fast it's moving. We can monitor how it's stepping. We can do all of that while at the same time recording neural activity. So this is real time. This is the animal moving around this surface of the actometer. Okay? So while it's doing that, we're recording neural activity. And this is the kind of data we collect. Let's just look at this lower panel. A, B, C, and D, and all those other little number, uh, letters there indicate stepping. So when a mouse is walking, it's putting left front down, right rear down, and then right front down and left rear down, and it steps. And that's what each one of these represents, stepping, in this wild type animal. This is a power spectrum analysis, and this animal is walking pretty normally. Very consistent pattern of walking. This is the R62 Huntington animal. It's covering the same distance. This is a one and a half second sample of movement. It's a long, fast run. The animal for one and a half seconds ran pretty fast and covered about 230 millimeters. Wild type, Huntington's. This animal is covering the same distance in the same amount of time, but it's not walking the same way the wild type is. It's kind of shuffling along. It's not coordinated, consistent pattern of walking. And the power analysis reflects that. And if you look here at this lower panel, this is that same long, fast run, one and a half seconds. This is a 20-second sample. One and a half seconds of walking. Here's that bursting activity that occurs right around in conjunction with this long, fast run. This is the R62 animal, a couple of neurons we're recording from. There's no bursting here. The animal's moving, but the firing pattern is very different than this behaving wild-type animal. And there's also a difference in the local field potential. The R62 animal shows a very different power spectral analysis of the local field. So even at the population level, neurons are not firing in the same way that they are in the wild-type animal. So just to summarize, and this occurs both in cortex and striatum, the firing patterns are disrupted. These animals are symptomatic. It doesn't matter what model. It occurs in R62s, it occurs in knock-ins. And we've even found recently, there's a rat model of Huntington's disease, the same thing happens. Less bursting, less coordinated activity. So it's not just a species thing, it's not just a genetic background thing. The only thing all these animals have in common, the rats and the two mouse knock-ins, is they have Huntington's disease. We've also recorded local field potentials in how these animals move. Uh, this is in a plus maze, or an X maze, it's just sort of tilted a little bit on the side. Again, this is on an actometer. We put the animal in one arm and let it wander around, that's all. And typically, a wild-type animal will walk down an arm, get to the choice point, turn right, turn left, or go straight. The Huntington animal will walk down an arm, get to the choice point, and for the most part, go straight. It doesn't turn very much. There's, there's sort of a behavioral inflexibility. This is a recording of a wild-type animal as it's moving through the plus maze. So it examines each arm. It turned here, went down that arm, goes down this arm, comes back here, and then it's going to turn again. So it turns. You know, it comes to the choice point, it either goes straight or it turns right or it turns left, and it'll do that for several minutes. The Huntington's mouse is also active, but it just doesn't turn very much. So we're recording neural activity, in this case, LFPs, while the animals are moving in the plus maze. And this is some LFP data, some power spectrograms. Each one of these arrows indicates when the animal reaches the choice point or the center part of that plus maze. And in the wild type animal, there's not much going on. I mean, you can't really see much of a change in the, in the LFPs. There's a slight increase in, in activity. In the raw data, though, it, it's really hard to pick out. 
But there's a very big difference in how the R62 animal is responding when it gets to that choice point, a dramatic increase. There's an increase in the lower end of the spectrum and also in the higher end of the spectrum, especially in beta activity in the LFP. So again, these neurons just aren't firing the same way as the wild type. There's a communication problem, the fundamental problem of communication between the cortex and the striatum. And at the end, if you know who all these characters are, you'll get extra credit. <laughs> and I'll also know how old you are. Okay, so there's a communication problem. But what does that have to do with vitamin C? Vitamin C, that's in fruits and vegetables. Oranges, citrus fruits, red peppers, potatoes, cabbages. Not brains. What does vitamin C have to do with any of this? Albert Zen Georgi, who gets credit for originally identifying the molecule, ascorbic acid, first called it, when he wrote a paper, he, he first identified it in red peppers. Red peppers have a lot of vitamin C. But he identified it in all those other fruits and vegetables I just listed. But when he first identified it, he sent his paper off and he called it ignos for the Latin ignosco and the standard suffix for sugars. He didn't know what it was, so he called it ignos. And the journal editor said, you can't call it ignos. Come on, give it a name. So St. Bjorgi responded, well, when you call it godnos, I don't know what this stuff is. I'll call it godnos. And the editor said, come on, you can't call it godnos. So they finally settled on hexuronic acid because it had six carbons and it was acidic. And a few years after that, it was discovered that this substance can actually prevent scurvy. And so it was called ascorbic acid. And in physiological form, it exists as a deprotonated molecule, so it's called ascorbate, or vitamin C. Now, St. Georgi wasn't so interested in this stuff. Vitamin C, you've got to eat vitamin C. You don't study vitamin C. You eat it. Why in the world would a scientist be interested in vitamin C? So he wasn't interested. But St. Georgi didn't realize that there's a lot of vitamin C in the brain, very high levels of vitamin C in the brain. This is the distribution of ascorbate in the rat brain. And you can see the areas we're interested in, cortex, striatum, and other areas of the forebrain have a high level of vitamin C. The tissue content of ascorbate in the forebrain is pretty high, not so much in the brainstem. So there's an uneven distribution of ascorbate. And by the way, this is in the rat. It's very similar in people. Now rats and most animals make their vitamin C. They make it from glucose. People, they have to go to Safeway or Wawa stores and they buy it. It doesn't matter. Distribution in the brain's the same. It's good to have vitamin C in the brain because vitamin C, or ascorbate, can act as an antioxidant. Antioxidants are good because the brain generates a lot of free radicals. Free radicals are bad because they can kill neurons. Too many free radicals, they're highly reactive molecules, they can destroy cells. Ascorbate is a good way to quench free radicals. There are other antioxidant mechanisms in the brain as well, but ascorbate is one of them. It's a good way of controlling free radicals caused by all that enzyme activity. Now, when I was on campus, it was the Vietnam War that caused free radicals. And so they were running around all over the place. But it's enzyme activity in the brain that generates free radicals, and you want to quench these free radicals. You want to try to suppress them. And ascorbate is good at that because it can donate electrons. It donates electrons to free radicals to calm them down. But the other thing about ascorbate, because it gives up electrons, means that you can measure it. You can measure it. Because those electrons you can detect as electrical current. And that's what voltammetry is all about. Voltammetry is a very simple way to measure oxidation reactions in the brain. 
uh, Ralph Adams at Kansas uh, originally applied the idea of voltammetry to the brain back in the 1970s. Here you have a beaker, it could also be a brain, it's the same thing. You have two electrodes, you have a reference electrode, could be a, a wire, silver, silver chloride wire for example, and you have a recording electrode or a working electrode. And if there's something in your beaker that can oxidize, you'll detect it. So you have a simple electrical circuit, you have a variable voltage, so you apply some voltage to your electrodes and you measure any oxidation reaction. The recording electrode will detect those electrons as electrical current and you measure that on your ammeter. So the concentration or how much of these oxidized molecules you have is directly proportional to the current that's generated. Pretty simple idea. Our working electrode or recording electrode is a carbon fiber. It's a pretty small fiber, it gives us good spatial resolution because it's only about 8 or 10 microns in diameter. It's sealed in a glass capillary. There's some glue down here to keep things from sliding up into the, into the uh, electrode. The carbon fiber extends beyond the glass of about 100 or 150 microns. And then there's bismuth at the other end to make electrical contact. So we can lower this into the brain to measure things like ascorbic acid or ascorbate. So we pass our voltage, here we're going from minus 300 up to about 400 millivolts, and what you see are three peaks. Again, this is in the striatum. The first peak, we're going from right to left, the first peak is ascorbate. We know this is ascorbate because if we remove ascorbate, this peak goes away. If we add ascorbate, this peak goes up. We get the same peak in a beaker, just have a beaker of ascorbate, this peak occurs at exactly the same place. So we're pretty confident this is ascorbate. There's another smaller peak that occurs farther out. That's a dopac peak. Dopac is the dopamine metabolite. And in striatum, most dopac is, is uh, found in fairly high concentration. There's some dopamine in here too, but not so much. And then there's a third peak, which is a uric acid peak. There's also some serotonin in that peak. But we're mostly interested in this ascorbate peak. And there are various ways to separate all these other things, but I won't get into that because we're going to focus on ascorbate. Now we've been studying ascorbate for a long time, longer than we've been studying Huntington's disease. So I won't go into all the details, but we know a few things about ascorbate. One thing is that in order to put ascorbate into the extracellular fluid of the striatum, to release it, to put it out there, you need to have cortical activation. The cortex has to be active just like the cortex is responsible for driving striatal neurons. Striatal neurons don't fire if the cortex doesn't tell them to. They're silent. The cortex drives those neurons. The cortex also is responsible for the release of ascorbate in the striatum. Another interesting thing is that this release of ascorbate into the extracellular fluid of the striatum depends on the uptake of glutamate. Glutamate's another neurotransmitter. It's an excitatory transmitter. Glutamate drives neurons, and that's what's being released by those cortical neurons onto the striatal cells. In order to get ascorbate to be released, glutamate has to be taken up, has to be removed. Ascorbate also modulates how these neurons respond to glutamate. Glutamate's an excitatory transmitter. You put glutamate on cells, cells fire. Ascorbate modulates that. It adjusts how strongly neurons will respond to glutamate. That's right. You know, you go down to your local Safeway, load up on ascorbate, and see if you can adjust the firing rate of your neurons in the striatum. It's not so easy to do, it turns out. But theoretically, I guess you could. But here's another interesting point. The release of ascorbate in the striatum is necessary for normal movement. We have some data on that, I'll just show you that briefly. It's another frontal section, this is a rat brain, and these black boxes here in the striatum represent some infusion sites. We infused into this box and then waited a little while and infused into this box. What we're infusing is ascorbate oxidase. That's an enzyme 
that breaks down a score bait. So basically, we're just removing a score bait from the striatum on both sides. This is a behaving rat. And we know we removed a score bait because we can also do voltammetry at the same time. Here's the peak before we infused a score bait oxidase. Here's the peak after. It's about an 80% reduction. So we got rid of a lot of a score bait. We didn't affect DOPAC too much. We didn't affect the uric acid peak too much. Dramatic reduction in a score bait. So we have some animals that are getting an infusion of saline, some animals that are getting an infusion of the oxidase to remove a score bait. This is a saline infusion. Animals are in the box for about two hours. First hour before the infusion, we just monitor what they do. They move around. About 40% of the time during that hour, they're moving. Sometimes we throw another rat in the box. We call that social. So they, each rat walks up to another rat and sniffs and touches the other rat. A little bit of that going on. And there's another uh, category called motivational or approach behavior. We put objects in the cage. Rats will often approach the object, touch it, make contact. And then about half the time, they don't do anything. Okay. So this is what happens when we infuse saline. Now, here's what happens when we infuse ascorbate oxidase. Not so much movement. Not so much social behavior. Not so much approach behavior. These animals are doing virtually nothing. 90% of the time, they're doing nothing. They're just sitting there like lumps. This ascorbate oxidase effect lasts for about 30, 35, 40 minutes. As it wears off, the animals start moving around, ascorbate levels come back up. So, it's kind of interesting. Extracellular ascorbate seems to be required for normal motor activity. Well, what about ascorbate in HD mice? could be altered. We certainly know we got a behavioral problem in HD mice. So here we go. This is our R62 animal. It's hooked up for voltammetry now. One of these wires is a reference. One is the recording electrode in the striatum. There's our peaks. We're moving right to left. There's the ascorbate peak, the dopac peak, the uric acid peak. And we're recording from the animal as it moves around. This is a, we can make these measurements. We make these measurements typically every minute. We can cut it down to every 10 seconds. It depends on how fast we want to scan. And most of these measurements are error every minute. Now here's something interesting. When animals wake up, if they're sleeping, score rate levels go up. The more active, the more awake an animal is, the higher the level of a score bait in the striatum. It's probably the case at least half of you in here have a high level of a score bait in the striatum. This is an HD animal when it's anesthetized, when it's sleeping. We have to anesthetize them because unlike the electrophysiology electrodes, which are chronically implanted, these carbon fibers you can't leave in for weeks on end. You put them in on the day of the recording. And mice move around a lot. So we anesthetize them briefly for about 30 or 40 minutes. And during that time, we lower our carbon fibers into the brain. And while they're sleeping, we take a measure of ascorbate. It's fine. You know, nice normal peak. This is when the animal wakes up. It's just the opposite of what it should be. Ascorbate levels are plummeting. They're going down. Again, not so much change in DOPAC, not so much change in uric acid. Just the opposite. Ascorbate levels are down when this animal is awake and behaving. An example of that. These are individual animals. This is a wild type. It's knocked out for about 30 or 40 minutes starts waking up, ascorbate levels start coming up, and in this case it goes up well above the anesthetized level. This is the Huntington's mouse. It's awake by now, but ascorbate ain't going up. It stays down. It stays down at the floor. It stays down here for several minutes, if not hours. And that's pretty evident here. DOPAC doesn't change very much. Ascorbate levels decrease in the Huntington's mouse. In the wild-type mouse, they go up when the animal wakes up. They're going in opposite direction. 
there's a problem with the score bait release. And this is the behavior of an HD animal over time. Symptoms start developing between five and six weeks. And all these recordings I show you were in animals that were about seven or eight weeks of age. So they were in this range here being symptomatic. And their behavior is just steadily going down. The animals shake a lot, they stay in one place, they can't walk very well, and it just gets worse and worse and worse until they eventually pass away after about 13 or 14 weeks. So, striatal ascorbate release is impaired. They're not scorbutic. They don't have a problem with the scorbate. The level of ascorbate in the brain is the same. It's just not released when it should be, when the animals are awake and behaving. So if you study this in a brain slice, you wouldn't see it. You have to look at a behaving animal. So release is impaired. So here's a question. If there's a decrease in ascorbate release, maybe there's a problem with glutamate uptake. Remember I said before that glutamate uptake and ascorbate release seem to be related. Well, we think there's a link to uptake. Here we're just infusing glutamate and measuring ascorbate. This is in a rat. And ascorbate levels go up dramatically as soon as we start infusing glutamate. And it's a very dramatic response. There's no change in DOPAC. And we know it's an uptake-related phenomenon because if we infuse deglutamate, which is the non-physiological form of glutamate, which is not taken up, there's no ascorbate release. So when glutamate gets taken up, we get ascorbate release. It's Saturday, so I'm going to show some cartoons. <laughs> glutamate uptake occurs mostly on glial cells. A lot of glial cells in the brain. We don't know too much about them, but they're pretty important. When a cortical neuron, for example, fires in the striatum, glutamate's going to get released, and it's going to be removed by these transporters on glial cells. And then ascorbate's going to get released. So glutamate gets taken up, and out comes the ascorbate. Now, we don't know if all the ascorbate's coming from the neurons. Some of it could be coming from glial cells. We think most of it comes from neurons because neurons have 10 times more ascorbate than glial cells. But in any case, when glutamate gets taken up, ascorbate gets released. Now, if we have an ascorbate deficiency, in HD mice, maybe there's a problem with glutamate uptake. That's important because glutamate is toxic. Glutamate is excitotoxic. Too much glutamate, you're going to excite cells to death. The primary protein for removing glutamate is GLT-1. It's responsible for taking up about 90% of glutamate that's out there in the extracellular space. And interestingly enough, GLT-1 is oxidation sensitive. If GLT-1 is oxidized, it doesn't work. So it might be a protein that actually needs to have a score beta around to reduce it so it's not oxidized. So maybe we have a problem with GLT-1 function. So maybe there's a glutamate uptake problem. And if there is a glutamate uptake problem, what can we do about it? Well, first we look to see if there really is a glutamate uptake problem. We did this in uh, collaboration with Bob Kennedy at the University of Michigan. Bob can do online microdialysis. Microdialysis is a way for measuring things in extracellular fluid of the brain, but it's typically slow. You have to wait 10 minutes or so to get a sample. When you do it online and you couple it with this fancy stuff, capillary electrophoresis and other things, you can make measurements every 10 seconds. So we can stimulate cortex record from striatum to see if glutamate is being released and to see if it's being taken up. And we can do this in normal mice and in R62 Huntington's mice. So just look at the filled in marks, these diamonds, black diamonds here. Stimulating cortex for about 10 seconds. Big increase in glutamate release. A decrease in glutamate release as soon as the stimulation gets turned off. Most of this decrease is due to uptake. Glutamate's being removed from the synapse. And so things come back down to normal fairly quickly. Look at the R62 animal. Stimulate cortex 
Glutamate gets released, actually not quite as much as the wild type, but look at that uptake. There isn't any. It's hanging up here. This glutamate that's released is stuck. And interestingly enough, there's no ascorbate release, remember? Ascorbate stays low when these animals are awake. These animals are awake too. It's stuck. Uptake is dramatically reduced. So, here's the problem. You don't have too much GLT-1 on glial cells. So when this cortical neuron fires, glutamate gets released, some of it gets taken up, but a lot of it's hanging out here in the synapse. It can continue to drive the postsynaptic cell, excite the postsynaptic cell, eventually, if you wait long enough, kill the postsynaptic cell. So how do you increase GLT-1? Well, there wouldn't be much of a story if there wasn't a way to increase GLT-1. It turns out there is. It's ceftriaxone. Ceftriaxone is an antibiotic. People use it every day. It's used to treat spinal meningitis. It's a third generation cephalosporin, which means it can cross the blood-brain barrier, unlike a lot of antibiotics. So ceftriaxone gets in the brain. It's a big molecule, but it gets in the brain. And it increases GLT-1 expression. That means there's more GLT-1 protein. So, now, let's treat these animals with ceftriaxone. So here comes the ceftriaxone. Wait for it. Boom. <clears throat> more GLT-1. So we've increased GLT-1 expression. So now, when glutamate gets released, it gets sucked up. Okay? There's less glutamate in the extracellular fluid. That's the idea. Let's see if it works. Here we're doing no net flux microdialysis. And just to give you a brief review here, I won't go into a lot of detail. This dotted line represents the point of no net flux, so we're infusing a certain amount of glutamate and seeing how much comes back. If the same amount comes back that we put in, that's no net flux. That means what's out there is what we put in. And if you look at the R62 animal treated with saline, where this curve crosses the dotted line, that's how much extracellular glutamate there is. It's about 9 micromolar. In the wild type animal, it's under 8 micromolar. So there's a difference. The Huntington's animal has more extracellular glutamate than wild type. If we treat these guys with ceftriaxone, the level of extracellular glutamate drops dramatically. In the R62 animal, it's down to 4 micromolar. It goes from 9 to 4. The same thing's happening, by the way, in the wild type. The other thing to notice is that the slope of these lines change. And the steeper the slope, the more uptake. So uptake increases. This is the R62 animal. You measure the slope of that line, this line versus that line. There's an increase after ceftriaxone. That means there's more glutamate being taken up. Same thing happens in wild type. But the wild type don't seem to matter. Doesn't seem to bother them. What does it do to the uh, Huntington's animals? This is just showing you that it really is GLT-1 that's altered. The western blot showing an increase in GLT-1 after septoraxone treatment compared to saline. It happens both in wild type and R6-2s. Immunohistochemistry verifies that there's an increase in GLT-1 and it occurs mostly on glial cells. But what about behavior? That's the critical thing. Well, we look at Huntington's mice here as a wild-type mice. One, one very simple behavioral test, you pick the animal up by the tail. And a wild-type animal will try to get away. You know, it's laying its legs out, it's trying to get away. A Huntington's animal will clasp. It puts its paws together and hangs out in a ball. So you can measure clasping. And that's what we do here if you just follow these gray circles. This is clasping over time, over a period of five days, and it's getting worse. The animals are showing more and more clasp. Here's the same R62 group, only this time these animals are treated with ceftriaxone. One injection every day for five days. Less and less clasping. By day three, there's a significant decrease in clasping behavior. We stop treating at day five, look at them one day later, and there's still a big improvement in clasping. It seems to go away by day seven. We've also looked at turning. Remember the plus maze? 
one day after treatment with ceftriaxone, these animals are turning just as much as wild type. Not so much by day seven. Seems to go away seven days later. Climbing behavior. It's another thing that R62 and, wild, and uh, Huntington's mice don't do. They don't climb very much. After ceftriaxone, they climb. It's very similar to wild type. Significantly different from the animals, the Huntington's animals treated with saline. And again, it goes away by day seven. So there is an improvement, a quite dramatic improvement in the Huntington's phenotype. And in case you want to know, yes, ceftriaxone also increases ascorbate release. If you just look at this bottom graph here, you can see a big increase in ascorbate after ceftriaxone treatment compared to the uh, Huntington animal treated with saline. It's quite dramatic. And it's really a GLT-1 problem because if we infuse DHK, which is a drug that blocks GLT-1, ceftriaxone doesn't work anymore. There's no further increase in ascorbate now when we stimulate cortex. So, glutamate uptake is impaired in HD striatum. If we upregulate GLT-1, as we can do with ceftriaxone, we increase uptake, we improve the HD phenotype. And if we have a glutamate dysfunction, we have a neuronal communication problem. What about that neuronal communication problem? The neurons fire better? Do they change? Well, let's look at some LFPs. This is a plus maze again. Remember, a wild type animal in a plus maze. Arrows indicate the choice point. Not much going on. This is the R62 animal treated with vehicle. Big activity when the animal's in the choice point. These animals don't turn very much. Now when we're recording from striatum in a ceftriaxone treated animal, it looks just like the wild type. We've improved communication by treating the animals with ceftriaxone. There's a fundamental problem of neuronal communication. It occurs in the striatum, it occurs in the cortex. There's a problem in ascorbate release that suggests a problem with glutamate uptake. And if we increase glutamate uptake by treating with ceftriaxone, we improve the ascorbate problem, we improve the glutamate uptake problem. So GLT-1 is, we think, a very good potential therapeutic target for Huntington's disease. Why not? There are a number of people that participated in this work, and I just want to list them here. There are a lot of graduate students and postdoctoral fellows and, and a large number of undergraduates. You know, when you come in to do this work, you know, you talk to a postdoc, you want to study vitamin C in the brain. Vitamin C? I didn't come here to study vitamin C. I want to study dopamine or glutamate. Or All right, so you go to the graduate student. Do you want to study vitamin C? Uh, well, I don't know if you want me to do, but I wanted to study dopamine or glutamate. You go to the undergraduate, study vitamin C. Oh, yeah, I'll study vitamin C in the brain. Hey, this is great. <laughs> so a lot of this work was done by the undergraduates. They worked together with the graduate students and the postdocs, but they really helped a lot. And I'd like to acknowledge all the other collaborators we have and, and NIH as well. So here's looking at you. Thank you very much. <laughs>